Here's what you missed on your turn today. My guest was Reverend Dr. Kelly Miller Smith Jr., and we discussed the status of our faith against the backdrop of 9 11. Hey, Nashville, how in the world are you? Well, hey, Wednesday's already here, and today is 9 11. And on this day, we always remember that 9 11 tragedy. And we do have a great show up for you, as we always like to say with your turn. We always say that we are building a more informed community, a more collaborative community, a more passionate community. And if you are informed, collaborative, and passionate, then you got to be active. It just comes natural. Huh? 403, three minutes past the four o'clock hour. And here's what we're going to talk about today before we get to our local news. With the 9-11, so many other tragedies, I think that if you're of a certain age, that that's one that stands out to you because it happened during your time. Of course, there were others, and there have been others before then, but there have also been others after then. So today, we have a phenomenal guest. He is Dr. Kelly Miller-Smith, Jr. He is live and in living color. You still living? As far as I can tell, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in living color. <laughs> His heart's still beating. Mm-hmm. He's in the studio with us today. And we're going to look at, see if we can just dialogue a little bit and examine, what do these tragedies do to our faith? Where is God in the middle of all of that? So make sure you tune in. Call somebody, text somebody, email somebody, tell them Dr. Kelly Miller Smith Jr. is on the air and we're about to talk about the impact of the 9-11 tragedy and other tragedies on our faith. 18 years ago, nearly 3,000 people died when hijackers took control of four commercial airplanes and crashed them into the World Trade Center buildings the Pentagon, and a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. More have died since from illnesses related to the destruction. And that brings us to what we want to talk about. Reverend Kelly Miller Smith Jr. We finally got him in here. I mean, I was stalking this guy. I I stalked him down at a a picnic, I think. (laughs) And wrote him, hey, didn't you come on the show? You're here. I wish it were a happier subject. But we have this situation with 9-11 tragedy. A little bit. I got to tell them something about you. You got a long 12, I got a 12 page <laughs> resume or something here on well, you don't somewhere. Read all that. <laughs> don't read I'll give them, I'll give them the hot spot. Yeah. The Reverend Dr. Kelly Miller Smith Jr. A lot of times when you find someone who's the son of a famous person, they're just kind of riding on their father's apron strings. But this guy is, has, has, is who he is in his own Right, but his father was the famous Kelly Miller Smith Sr. He was a Baptist preacher, he was an author, and I consider him one who was on the front line of the civil rights movement and here in Nashville, and he died in 1984. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1984 he passed. But, and then after a bunch of different pastors at First Baptist Church Capitol Hill, finally in 2010, mm-hmm. Reverend Kelly Miller Smith Jr., brought himself out of Knoxville and moved to Nashville. He came home, basically. Yeah. Came home. And your mom is still living. Yes, she is. And right still right. beautiful. Yes. She's still beautiful. And I've seen you on Facebook taking her some places, too. Oh, yeah. You just, she's like your road partner. That's right. Mm-hmm. Road partner. Mm-hmm. But but let's get at it. So um, you, you, you were in Knoxville for 19 years mm-hmm. as pastor of Mount Olive Baptist Church. And um, did you... Your parents grew up in Mount Bayou. You didn't. No, no, no. My dad grew up in Mount Bayou. My mother grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, Bayou. But um, they were actually living here in Nashville at the time I was born. So just so happened through circumstances that I ended up being born there, even though they were actually living here in Nashville. Okay. And and you're very active in the community. You've got so many ministries that you've established, not only at Mount Olive, but here in Nashville. You are a former executive director of the Sunday School Publishing Board of the National Baptist Convention and currently serving or formerly served on all these different boards at local, state, and national le- levels. How do you keep up with yourself? Well, I see myself coming sometimes. <laughs> you're Sigma Pi Phi fraternity. Uh, you have three children, and oh, this is so much stuff, so much stuff. You and you do so much, um, and you 
Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, mm -hmm. where you were a Samuel Proctor, mm -hmm. Otis Moss Fellow, and after serving six years as pastor of Berean Baptist Church in Nashville, I didn't, I didn't realize you would also have been That's at right. another church here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. So you know your way around the Bible. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're not flipping to the back to look for Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> Even so, though I talked, actually, we talked about Genesis in Bible study today. So. I want to see if we can use this time that we have to talk about where we are in our faith. You know, I know that we are in a war. We're in a war. Mm -hmm. There's a war between races we live in, races between black and white. There's, there's a war between uh, love and hate. There's so much evil out there now. Uh, there's a spiritual war going on. Where, do, where is God in the midst of all of this? Well, you know, God is always in the midst of everything. I think part of the challenge we have is not fully understanding what God's role is and how God actually uh, handles and deals with tragedies, deals with um, things that are going on, things that are happening in the world around us. So uh, part, of our, part of where we allow our faith to go is to understand how God operates. We want God to be, or sometimes want God to be our, um, you know, our security guard, we want God to be our waiter, we want God to be our bellman, we want God to be all those sort of things. And all of those things are personally centered. They're centered on who we are and what we are about and what is going to be in, what is going to be in our best interest. And part of our challenge is needing to understand not so much what is our will, but what is God's will. And when we understand God's will and we find ourselves working in the midst of God's will, we'll discover that we're going to have to, we're going to, have to deal with tragedies. We're going to have to deal with heartbreak. And we're going to have to deal with hard times. We're going to have to deal with all kinds of things because um, that's just the nature. Even God's uh, begotten son stuff. And you would have thought that uh, God would have always put an ark of uh, protection around Jesus so that uh, there would be no hurt, harm, or danger that would come to him, but that never was the case. Uh, God understands that, um, and we need to understand that God operates in such a way that, you know, it's not that God is going to keep us from hurt, harm, and danger. There are some very religious people, some people of very strong faith, who suffer tragedies, who suffer mm -hmm. depression, as you were reading earlier, and suffer through all the other things that uh, happen in the rest of the world. The question we have to respond to is do we trust God to keep us in terms of um, imperfect peace, as the Bible says, keep us mm -hmm. in a peace that doesn't allow all... We talk about 9-11, for instance, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember very succinctly what uh, happened on that day that I was um, in Knoxville, and I you know, heard on the news about the first tower being hit, and I, was, I just stood there stunned and, and was watching the TV when the second tower was hit. And then just dealing with all the dynamics of that day and wondering what is happening. Are we at war? You know, are, are we being attacked? What do we need to do? Uh, I was to come to Nashville later on that day. And uh, it was just, it was just uh, um, perhaps one of the more stunning um, experiences, not really knowing how to respond or whatever the case may be. Is into broadcast excellence. It's all about you. Because it's your turn with Sherry Bishop. <clears throat> and now, back to your turn with Sherry Bishop. And we are back, 423, 23 minutes past the 4 o'clock hour today, 18 years later, and how it has impacted our faith. Um, so a lot of people, Reverend Smith, it seems like that was like the first big tragedy that kind of changed everything, and we know that it wasn't. But it, but in a, in a sense, it did change a lot of things. I remember that being the first time we had to take our shoes off at the airport. You go through the magnetometer. You know they changed all the what was that checkpoint? Yeah, the security. Yeah, they changed all they changed all the security checkpoint stuff, and there was a lot more security mm -hmm. in all airports. So that did a lot of things did change. And then we started looking a little bit sideways at Muslims, mm -hmm. and we and and even now, with other things that have happened, I think that 
it changed how we feel because if somebody sets off a firecracker in the middle of a crowd, people panic and scatter now. We're on edge. I mean, so what what has happened to our world? That have we lost all innocence? I mean, we're numb to something. Well, part of what happens is that um, we allow evil to win. We allow persons who have circumstances and situations that are happening um, to, uh, to cause us to live in fear. And so when we hear of terrorists who have done, whether they are foreign terrorists or they're domestic terrorists, because you know, we've been dealing with domestic terrorism for decades. You know, that's part of what uh, many persons had to fight when we were dealing with Jim Crow uh, issues, when we were dealing with segregation, when we were dealing all that with domestic terrorism, where they would string somebody up, hang somebody, strange fruit, as they say. Yes. And yeah. uh, so we've been dealing with this. It just, you know, it's kind of interesting that we become very stunned and shocked when things happen to a majority community over against the things that continue to happen in, in the uh, African American community. It does not negate you know, the tragedies of what happened such as 9-11, such as what's happened in Texas a couple of times, what's happened, uh, you know, in other places, you know, here in, in Nashville um, and other places around the, um, around the country. And um, so we just live in a strange society and what, there, are, there are those elements out there that are trying to cause us to live in fear. Unfortunately, we also have a president who wants us to live in fear as well. And so people are frightened and concerned because of the fact that the, some of the rhetoric that he's offering and some of the things he says, it, all it does is promote fear. And we have to make sure that we don't allow our lives to be guided by fear or to be changed or channeled by fear. 615-242-7760, the phone lines are open for you. How did the 9-11 tra tragedy affect your faith? Or how you, do you feel safe? We want to hear from you today, 615-242-7760. Hello, caller, it's your turn. Hi, how are you? What's on your mind? It's a lot of things just a second ago about change. And when you mention churches have changed. Well, you know, I've been calling the show for years, and a lot of times I kind of warn people, they always just say, well, you just always talking negative. Well, see, I can tell you about church because I live in the church. Y'all heard that saying? And I know when people are changing. And you know what it is too? See, I, I remember 9-11. I remember that because I didn't believe it. Because I just knew, you can't get us. You'll never be able to get something like that would never happen to us. But then, we've had so many things that happened since 9-11. Yeah, I heard you say if you go by something. And everybody listening, where, where can you run to now? Please someone explain that to me. You said the churches have fell down. I go to church all the time. They're lacking in every angle. I'll tell you what I see and live through. Are you saying the church is lacking? I'm coming to you said why, why there's no, you know, the, the people that normally, the, the number of churches, let me say this, the number of members and the church, the Christians have fell off just, and I deal with a lot of churches. And they, that number of Christians, the number of church people have fell and don't even mention the kids. Well, did y'all not see that? Yeah, well, you know, yeah, many churches uh, don't have the same level of membership of persons who actually physically come to uh, their buildings as they have in the past. And I don't know very specifically what the statistics are as it pertains to that, simply because of the fact it's a part of their tradition, not because mm -hmm. they're looking for help, not because they're looking for hope. Uh, there are those who do that. So you know, apron string Christians, they just go because mama did it, daddy did it. And they did it, and that, that's the only thing they know to do in that designated hour of worship, you know, on mm -hmm. Sunday morning or Saturday night, whatever the case may be. Mm. Earlier, I live in church, you know, when we say that, I mean, you always that. But I've noticed the the feel is gone. Because I've been in church 50 years, please. What, what, you said the feeling is gone? What kind of feeling? The feel is that. I remember back in the day that church was number one. Let's just let's get down to it for a second. Church was always number one with black people. Amen? But what kind of feeling is missing? Excuse me? You said the feeling is gone. I guess you think about B.B. King, the thrill is gone. What kind of feeling is gone? See, just 
Because see, because you don't have a different feeling of surrounding. That's why you all are talking about them today. You all gonna tell me that your all church feeling hasn't changed? I think it has changed, but you know, I, I'm in I'm in Mount Zion, and and Bishop Walker has said many times that you can't do uh, uh, what is it a CD ministry? You can't run an eight track ministry in an iPod CD world. You can't. I mean, so so things. It yet yeah, sounds good, but it's true. It's tight, but it's right. In this, you can't reach these young people. Even in a classroom, these children aren't going to sit still in a classroom with you writing on a chalkboard and doing PowerPoint slide presentations. You got to have stuff moving around and colors, and you got to be animated. And it's the same with the church. Our attention spans have changed. I'm getting ready to say because it has changed, haven't it? That's why you all brought it up. It has changed. You anybody have the answer? Well, yeah, things have changed, but the world changes. You know, there are things that we do now that are different than what we did five years, ten years ago. And so we cannot expect what was the, uh, what was the norm for churches back a generation ago to be what's going to continue to attract and to appeal to people today. You know, I know there's a song that we sing sometimes in church, given that old-time religion, and it's a nice <laughs> song. Uh, but uh, I think people take it uh, in the wrong context because they want things to be as they were. That's doing the same thing, ushers doing the same things they were doing, choirs singing the same kind of songs they were doing, preachers doing the same kind of preaching, and yet it is not meeting the need and the expectation. So, yeah, we can say that, you know, that, that things are different, but that's okay, because the world is different. And the purpose of the church is not to simply maintain what it was doing, uh, but it is to do what it needs to do to meet the needs of uh, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we understand that we still have the same Christ. Uh, we just don't have the same method about uh, sharing the gospel and sharing Jesus Christ. You know, it, it may seem as if we've gotten off to topic in talking about how our faith is impacted by 9-11 because we're now talking about what's going on with the church. But I tell you what, it's still inextricably linked because... If the, it seems like now that people have gotten away from the word, then the personalities have changed. And I truly believe that a lot of this evil that we're seeing. Yeah, there are a lot of people who need Jesus. Uh, there are a lot of people who need faith. Um, the challenge is, again, they're not making the connection. They're not making connection of what is important for their own lives. And we have to find ways, constructive ways. And it's not going to always be, you know, again, the church... Uh, has to understand it doesn't need to uh, always expect people to come to it. The church has to learn how to go to them. You remember that again in the life of Jesus Christ, he never had a physical building, not only a place where he called his headquarters, not even a place for him to live. As he said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have their nets, mm -hmm. nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Uh, but where this is not only geographical places, but also mm -hmm. spiritual places in terms of physiological places, where they were in terms of their health, where they were in terms of their whole lives. And even the least of these. Yeah, and among those, you know, he hung out with those who were uh, tax collectors and, and, and sinners and prostitutes and mm -hmm. persons who were on the out, uh, outskirts of life. And he mm -hmm. talked and preached about that. And so we must understand the importance of the church going to where people are, keeping as the core purpose of what we do, the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, the message of God. But understanding that we have to make sure that we speak a relevant word uh, to that, you know, and 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 again, we're not we're 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 not all you know. Most churches um, have difficulties in terms of keeping the appeal, keeping the attraction, um, because of the fact we're not really uh, you know we're not scratching where it itches. <laughs> where were you when the nine eleven tragedy took place? 18 years ago. What were your first thoughts? Give us a call 615-242-7760. We're talking about that against the backdrop of how has that impacted our faith today? We have, we're almost, it's like all of a sudden the, the abnormal is normal. We see, we're seeing school shootings and church shootings and just so many things. And I wanted to ask my guest, Reverend Dr. God just stop this. If he's in the midst, why doesn't he stop it? But I have to shift that question now because the first thing I thought when I thought of that question was, 
a sign that I saw on Schrader Lane Church of Christ. They have these quotes out on the marquee. And they had one one day that said, because when these tragedies happen and God doesn't seem to do anything about it, it seems like God is farther away. And this marquee on this church said, if God seems farther away, ask yourself who moved. Mm -hmm. And that penetrated me. I had to think about that for a while. Well, not only uh, have people moved away, but there are some people who never even thought about drawing close or drawing near. You have to also keep in mind that you know what? What may be somebody's tragedy is is also somebody else's opportunity. God is expecting us to help and to minister to one another. Uh, God is not going to just wave a magic wand and to fix everything, because then therefore we get spoiled. We take for granted uh, the things that are done. Even right now, when we receive what we call blessings, and then uh, we get spoiled. We get uh, you know we get. Uh, 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 as I said, take things for granted to believe that, you know, well, that's just the way it's supposed to be. We know that God's going to always come to our aid. And so, therefore, that does not cause us to be responsible, does not cause us to draw close, does not cause us to, to develop a greater sense of intimacy in our relationship with God. And I asked that question because I was a TV news reporter in North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina. A tornado came through there. This was a neighborhood where people just pretty much focus on their work, operate it, operated in their isolated silos and on didn't even really speak to each other but when that tornado hit the next day they were out there grilling together talking to each other and interact helping each other cleaning up each other's houses rebuilding why does it what is it about human nature where it requires or is god in that why does it require tragedy for us to connect it's something that all people can identify and relate to you know, again, you're talking about 9-11, you talk about the sh shootings that happen in various places. That becomes something that affects um, a feeling within all of us. The unfortunate thing is that, you know, after we, and so since tragedy becomes a common denominator, uh, we don't allow joy, we allow some joyful things, you know, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate uh, 4th of July, where we observe uh, 4th of July, there are other things that we do allow to bring bring us together, you know. Again, people have a Christmas spirit at Christmas time, Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah. You know, they do things a little differently uh, then. But uh, but you know, the challenge is we just don't have those things that are enough common denominators for us that call that we can uh, live with each other, we can love each other. We are living again in a society and in, in a world and a country right now that uh, is working harder and harder to create um, um, separation, you know, among people. Uh, it's unfortunate, as I heard in the news, I haven't read the full article, but that, uh, again, the, uh, our uh, government is not allowing persons from the Bahamas uh, to come here if they don't have proper documentation. You know, of course, these people didn't even know they were needing to come to the United States. They're living in a land that has, uh, right now, they're in a land that has several dead bodies all over the place. They yeah. don't have structures from home. They don't have fresh water. They don't have electricity. They have nothing. They have no way to even request a visa or any other documentation to be able to come here. But yet, this country that is supposed to accept all persons, the huddled masses, yes. uh, uh, has this said that, no, we're going to shut the door. Y'all just going to stay out there and die. Then the president offers the rhetoric again, you know, well, you know, there can be criminals and, and drugs and other kind of things Very that are coming here. People. And all these bad people that we can let in here. So he does not have the sensitivity even of what it means to and the same he did the same thing with all with the part of our own country with Puerto Rico yes. where they had the hurricane. So and and people are beginning you talk about a new norm. People are beginning to think this is okay to not right. like people, not to be receptive and in particular uh, of who color. are colouring their skin. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, now again he looks for those who are Scandinavians, he looks for those who are Asian and others to come, but not people who are people of color. Uh, to be able to come because yeah, even if they're in the midst of tragedy he says you know tough love mm -hmm. wow we do need jesus hey we got to pause for a quick break reverend dr kelly miller smith jr is my guest we're talking about the 9 11 tragedy as our backdrop and looking at how it has impacted our faith we've got to take this break when we come back i want to kind of see if we can do a quick scan in the last 15 minutes on the history of tragedy in the lives of african americans and how we persevered how our faith brought us through. You stick around. And now, back to your turn Here we go. with Sherry Bishop. 
We are wrapping up on the last 10 minutes of your turn. I'm Sherry Miller Bishop, your host. And today is September 11th and every year you have all these observances for the 9-11 tragedy and it was so big and so awful that it's one that is embedded in our heart forever. And I heard someone today talking about how we spend too much time talking about the first responders and we need to think about all the other stories behind that. But I don't we as a people don't fully understand or appreciate the fact that you know it's not uh, somebody's situation is worse um, than than another because you know it's just like when um, you know, just in general when a person dies and just because a person may be popular or well known uh, and may have a big funeral does not mean that the hurt is any different than a person who has a very small family is not well known maybe just a person working in a domestic situation and uh you know hurt is hurt pain hurt, is pain pain is pain. and um it's the same too if you had somebody who uh if you had somebody who died was killed tragically suddenly versus somebody who was sick for sure. 10 years mm -hmm. i mean you you know you you have a little bit more time to prepare for losing them but the pain still can't be measured right and we have to understand that again we have some strange perspectives and philosophies on a lot of things uh, you know, we were talking about the whole tragedy uh, of 9-11. Of, of Do you know that there are some countries that have begun putting the United States on their uh, terror watch list wow. because of what, uh, what happens here in, in the Walmarts and in churches and places of worship um, and in you know, just public places at festivals? And, and so they, they've indicated, similar to what our country does, our country has a list and says, listen, this is a country you should not go to. You may not... Uh, want to go to, we recommend you not go, uh, that the, there are other countries that have done that to the United States because of the kind of tragedies that we are beginning to see and uh, how random they are. You know, if we were at war, you could understand that, uh, that why, there, why there are human lives that are being lost. Um, but when you are just trying to live your life mm -hmm. and then someone decides they're going to recklessly uh, just uh, and just irresponsibly, whatever, I'm not even sure what the right word is, mm -hmm. uh, do what they do in order to wreak havoc in the lives of others, to promote uh, an agenda of hatred and of, of evil that, uh, you know, you just don't know where to go, you don't, you don't know, mm -hmm. but then you have to keep living, you have to keep yeah, doing what you're living. doing, uh, you know, uh, when you, you know, kind of like what they say in airports and other places, you, know, if you see something, say something, so if you're if you're going around about your regular life doing what you do, and something just looks out of place, uh, then you know you then you then you need to tell someone. Now of course you know there have been some situations in the news where some people thought they saw something, right. and they and uh, those that thought they saw something, it's usually they thought they saw something with a person of color. Right, that's correct, uh, and and so you know it's 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 hard for us to discern. And we have to understand, but we be respectful of the fact that, uh, you know, that, you know, when, when, if, if, if there is something that's going on and there's something that we see that uh, even ourselves, you know, we'd rather there be some interaction so that we can figure out what's going on or, or at least there'll be police or some other, um, you know, uh, uh, first responders that can come and to uh, address the situation, you know. If, if, if my house being, is being broken into, I don't care if the person's black or white, I want somebody to, to call the police and, and, uh, and, and, and somebody be on the way. Now, the other part of the challenge is to make sure that when those responders come, that they still treat people with respect. You know, I saw uh, one situation on, uh, on uh, the internet, I know on the news, I guess it was, where a man was in his own house and the police came and handcuffed him and other kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there ought to be some ways in which uh, police officers and others mm -hmm. should know how to respond so that it doesn't escalate a situation to the point where there are, there creates other kind of complications and somebody's life is imperiled or lost. I'm glad to hear you, uh, now that you brought up about the, the situations with police and we know what the, the history we've been hearing with unarmed black men and it's 453 and we just gonna have to bring you back but i do want to see if we can tackle it just a little bit in in, in against the backdrop of the 9 11 tragedy and the many tragedies that have been born upon african americans 
and how we have persevered, especially, you know, with slavery, uh, the Reagan administration, you know. How have we, just kind of take us through that real quickly with some examples and just how we've been able to persevere in our faith. Well, you know, um, it is interesting. I, I was reading not too long ago um, a book by Howard Thurman, uh, Jesus and yes. the Disinherited, yes. and how it was that there was, um, I think, um, how is it that you can worship a Jesus, have a Jesus, uh, or be a part of a religion, be a part of a faith tradition that uh, supports slavery, that supports uh, racism, that supports all these other ills and vices? And Howard Thurman's response to the person was the fact that you know sometimes what we see um, uh, promoted within churches and so forth is not the religion of Jesus Christ. It is not. The, it is not what Jesus stood for or what he represented. It is people's skewed perspective on how, you know, because, mm. you know, even during uh, slavery, you know, they would tell slaves, obey your masters. You right, know, that right. they would uh, uh, um, uh, promote, you know, the Klan had chaplains, you know, mm -hmm. person, because they thought that what they were doing was within, that they were right in doing that. Uh, but we have to understand that, um, you know, that even with uh, what's happened throughout our history here in this nation, that there has, there has been a core of people who've understood not what the churches are doing, but what Jesus was doing, what Jesus Christ was saying, what he was, what we read. And, and that's how you keep it straight. And that's how you keep it straight. Because uh -huh. of the fact that you, you understand that churches sometimes get it wrong. All right, 615-242-7760. Hello, caller, it's your, caller, it's your turn. Yes, I just want to call in and say thank you so much for your guest today. Uh, that minister, the minister you have on today is, is for the type of minister we need at this time, uh, where he's speaking the truth and he's speaking it with wisdom and he's letting us know it's not we don't need to have a spirit of fear, and yet it's so much intelligence that he's speaking. And I just want, uh, maybe you can have him to come back periodically, but... This this is what we need. We, we need this type of ministry, and I just say God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you very much. Uh, keep praying for us, um, even as all of us all across this city uh, in various places of worship, whether it's Christian, whether it's uh, Muslim, whether it's um, um, uh, Jewish, or whatever the tradition may be, there are many of us who are trying to speak for what is right, what, a, um, what is for social justice, what is for a, a civil order and other kind of things. And it's a tough place for us to be in terms of this life and this living. And yet there are those of us who have to stay on the battlefield and try to speak what God has us to share. Thank you. A lot of people have said that, you know, where is the church? The church used to be the centerpiece. Where is the church amid all this stuff that's going on uh, in politics and in our world? Are we aware of do you think people are aware enough of what some of the pastors and ministers are doing, or are we missing in action? Well, they are, but you know, it's just like um, we do in the news. We look for sensational things that have negative implications and ne negative uh, messages. Um, and so those who are doing, there are a lot of churches that are doing a lot of very positive and very, but they don't, they don't, they don't look for the limelight. They just get out there and do the work because it's not about trying to get attention. It's about trying to help people and trying to make a difference in their lives. But there are a lot of churches all across this city, all across this nation that have done things and that are doing things, that are looking to do even more things. You know, we have to address, for instance, in this nation, uh, in this city, this whole, whole homeless population. Yes. You know, what are we going to do about that? And uh, we don't build walls so they can be on their side and we're on our side. Mm -hmm. Similar to what, you know, I was, and I know our time is almost up. I shared as part of my sermon on Sunday, um, and this is related in a different kind of way, um, an article that I read by James Dobson, who mm -hmm. started an organization yeah. called Focus on the Family, and how he was asked by the White House and the Trump administration to uh, go down to Texas and see the conditions down there and to report it back to the people so they can know what the government is doing. He went down there and saw the deplorable situation. He mentions that in his article, talks to, about how he saw people behind fences and, 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 and so forth. And even in one context, he said that a uh, translator translated for him saying that, you know, uh, tell the people that God loves them and I love you also. And he was telling this to these Latinos who were there behind the fence. But then his conclusion was, 
that, you know, we need to support Trump's wall because we don't need these people coming here infiltrating this land. Uh, we don't need them to come and change our way of life. They're poor, they're uh, illiterate. Uh, they don't have any resources that can help us. And so I didn't realize that uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is about just those persons who are or the opposite of the least, those who are the haves. We must understand ministry has to be to the haves, the have-nots, and all those who fall in between. All right, Reverend Dr. Kelly Miller Smith Jr., pastor of First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill. We are not out of comments, but we are out of time. We're going to have to, I promise you, I'm going to nab him down at another picnic or something, <laughs> and we're going to bring you back. Thank you for joining us here you. on your Thank turn. You. And my final comments we are in a war. And what do we do about it? You got to be ready. You got to do what you need to do to be prepared. You got to get in your word. You got to make sure you're in position. And then you got to look to God and knew him in the past tense. Not just know him. You got to knew him. You got to already know what he's going to do. And you know that God is love. He gives love and he is love. Hey, we're out of here. Listen. Uh, Thursday tomorrow, you got the king in house. Well, the earthly king, Damon King's going to be back in the house. Lady Shantae and Straight Talk is on at this hour tomorrow from 4 to 5. I'm back in here on Monday and I'm going to bring some folks in. They're going to clue us in on what's happening with the uh, widening of Clarksville Highway and all that good stuff. Listen, tomorrow is September 12th, the election day. If you didn't early vote, tomorrow's your last chance. Get your hiney out and vote for our next mayor. Get your hiney out and vote for the city council and council at large members. Make sure you do that. Dr. Bobby Jones is up next. And as I always like to say, be true to the one in the mirror. God made you in his image. Now you go represent. I'm Sherry Bishop. This has been your turn. He is, Hi, so how are to you? Kelly Miller Smith, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't get to let him leave his last. My last encouraging word is to just keep faith and to understand that you know, even as difficult as the world and life around us may appear to be, that in reality, uh, God is still in charge, God is still in control. We can trust in Him, and He's in control of our spirit. And so, we must understand that we can rely on God to help guide us through no matter what He has we're called upon to face. So it, it's, um, it looks like he is still in charge. He doesn't go out of style like fashions and other stuff. No. All right. And when's your service at First Baptist Church Capitol Hill? We have a Sunday morning service at 10 o'clock with um, Bible study. We have two Bible studies on Wednesday. One is at noon. The other is at 6 o'clock. So